Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's Dealer On webinar, the three mistakes killing your online sales and how to fix them. My name is Eliana Raggio and I'll be your moderator today. Today's webinar is being presented by Dealer On. For anyone who isn't familiar with Dealer On, we're an award-winning website development company and digital agency best known for our amazing SEO, the best customer service, and the highest converting website designs in the industry, including the award-winning Chameleon Responsive Website Platform. We just got back from NADA, where we were awarded the Driving Sales Dealer Satisfaction Award for the top-rated websites for an unprecedented sixth year in a row, yes! And we also took home the AWA Award for Best Websites, plus FCA announced that we're now an approved vendor. We are still the only company in the industry that offers a money-back lead guaranteed program. It's been a great month. You want to know more about us? Yeah, you do. You can check us out at DealerOn.com. Also, DealerOn will be exhibiting and presenting at the upcoming Digital Dealer Convention April 11th through the 13th in Tampa, Florida. So if you're going to be there, please stop by booth 411 and say hi. I'll be there. I'd love to meet you. You can also check out the incredible speaking sessions by Greg Gifford and Sean Rains. Remember, it's booth 411. We hope to see you there. We have a great show in store for you today. We are very pleased to have the one and only Corey Mosley as our presenter today. Corey Mosley is the principal of Mosley Automotive and a proven leader in transforming dealerships. A go-to strategist and progressive retail expert, Corey looks beyond simple solutions to help his clients uncover and correct complex issues that drive customer satisfaction, accelerate sales, and fuel profitability. Over the past 18 years, Corey has been featured at every major automotive conference, including Driving Sales, J.D. Powers, NADA, and was the first internet sales expert to keynote the Digital Dealer Conference. In addition to his more than 18-year sales and consulting career, he's also the author of The Way I See It, Thoughts, Commentary, and Musings of a Retail Car Guy and hosts the show Progressive Retail with Corey Mosley on the CBT Automotive Network. He can be reached at Corey at MosleyAutomotive.com. And hey, guess what? It's happening! Three of the biggest names in the automotive industry, David Kane, Corey Mosley, and Jennifer Suzuki, I love all three of them, by the way, are joining forces to host the Internet Sales Performance Summit. This three-city tour will feature deep-dive hands-on training with David, Corey, and Jennifer, plus some special invited guests, including members of the Dealer On team. That's right, we're a sponsor. Dates and locations will be announced soon, so visit MosleyAutomotive.com and sign up to be the first to know when the Internet Sales Performance Summit will be in your city. You don't want to miss it. Now, during the presentation, if you have any questions, please use the question feature located on the corner of your screen to submit them. At the end of the presentation, we'll answer those questions of general interest. If we're unable to get to your question live, we're going to try to respond by email later today. Don't forget, a link to download a copy of this webinar recording will be emailed to you later today for your reference, and feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues. Oh, and guess what? Our good friends over at Mosley Automotive Woo, they're giving away some great prizes today on the webinar. Two of you lucky webinar attendees are going to win a private 30-minute coaching call strategy session with Corey Mosley himself. You heard me. Fabulous prize, right? You have to be on the live broadcast to win it, though. And, and not only that, if you win that prize, you also have a choice of winning either a signed copy of his book, The Way I See It, a coffee mug that says it's okay to rewrite the rules, or a Keep Calm, I'm a Closer t-shirt. Your choice. You get to pick one of those as well. Plus, hey, you never know. There might be some other prizes and surprises in store for your attendees today. Now, remember, you got to be on live broadcast to win it, though. Stay tuned. Who knows? You might be winning an awesome prize today. Also, at the conclusion of this webinar, you're going to get a short survey. So fill it out. We're always looking for quality feedback from our audience. We want your opinion to be heard. And hey, do you tweet much? We hope you do. We'd love to see what you have to say about today's presentation. So tag us in it. You can use hashtag DealerOnWebby. I'm at Eliana Raggio. You can also hit up Corey Mosley at Corey Mosley. We look forward to seeing what you're saying. So let's get started. Let's learn the three mistakes killing your online sales and how to fix them. Oh, it's always a good day when I have Corey Mosley on the line. Mr. Mosley, how are you, sir? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. You know, if we were live, like and you were doing this introduction, this is that point in the session before you start where you're like, give a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome him to the stage. for Eliana for, you know, that wonderful introduction that she has to do 
every week. You're so kind. Over You're so over. kind. Okay. You enough. Know, Bring more. I, no, no, no. Enough. Enough. No. Uh, seriously. I, no, no, no. <laughs> I want to say I, I got into consulting, you know, because my mind just works on new challenges all the time, right? So the idea of just having to say that same thing over and over again would just crush me. So uh, <laughs> you do a great job at it. So, so I want to thank everybody. I want to thank everybody for joining us. I know people are still strangling in. I know middle of the day is always tough. So for those of you that don't get to attend live, um, I thank you in the replay uh, room later for uh, taking a look at this information. And for me, when we talk about three problems that cost dealer sales online, I mean, of course, you know, as a practitioner, you know, actively working with stores, but but also kind of setting policy, quote unquote, um, with with some manufacturers and some things, I have the opportunity to see you know some data and and just different facets of the marketplace, which I think is interesting. And there's kind of these key reoccurring things that uh, you know ultimately have become trends. So that's what we want. We spend so much time, I think, in reactive mode in our businesses, right? So it's the middle of the month. You're having these middle of the month meetings now as to where you are, who's behind, who's ahead. You know, what do you need to do to to catch up? Are you on pace? And we're so reactive. You know, in a few more weeks, right? We'll start all over again. You know, I always call the auto industry the retail business. Really, is just one big Janet Jackson song, right? You know, her '80s hit, "What Have You Done for Me Lately?" Uh, ooh, yeah. So that's basically what it is, right? We'll spend the next couple of weeks, and then you'll go to your chipboard or your marker board or, or your slide board, and you'll take all that stuff down like a tower of Jenga falling, and then you'll get to start all over again. And we don't have a lot of time to be really strategic or to be as proactive as we'd like to be. So these are kind of three kind of key areas where I see people are just using, uh, uh, losing business opportunities and conversion opportunities because I think we all agree it's just so ultra competitive. So from an objective standpoint, I'm going to go through these self-titled, self-described three problems. I want to share with you some free resources that I really hope you'll take advantage of. The lovely Eliana will come facilitate uh, some of our great, um, our great giveaways here. Um, if you're not a reader, if you like T-shirt, we've got it's a couple great neat things um, that I think you'll you'll like. In addition to the strategy session, and then of course, as always. Um, I'm, I'm open for any type of Q&A. So that's kind of our objectives. For those of you who don't know, I notice a lot of you, I'm, I'm very thankful I've been doing this. Um, I've been in the business 18 years. I've been doing this uh, since 2004 um, as mostly automotive. So for those of you, though, who have never heard of me before and new to me, you know, one of the things I always like to get out of the way because in the training teaching environment, it's always this question of why should I listen to you or or there are several people who, who educate and have good information, um, but really are not necessarily from the retail environment. They weren't in the retail stores. So I always like to take a few moments to point out, you know, not only have I been, not only am I an active practitioner, but I've also been there too. So if you didn't realize from any of the um, photos or pictures prior to this, um, and you're confused about which person I might be here, I'm the one in the middle, uh, if you were unsure. And thank you very much in advance. I know I have not aged a day. Thank you, thank you so much. So, I wanted to uh, I wanted to share that because you know I've got the official golf shirt on. Somebody right now is wearing their official golf shirt, or if you're in the Northeast, the golf sweater uh, of of the dealership. I know I have some. I had some. And if you look in the corner, I'm dating myself a little bit. If you look on our hips, you see our lovely pagers. Now in our store, of course. You had to wear the official golf shirt, and then there was only one color of khakis you were allowed to wear. So that's why we look like we're kind of uh, all in unison, uh, because we were. But that's the BDC environment. So these things I'm talking about, this is this is not just from taking on the role of trainer or consultant, but it, it is taking on the role of having to uh, having to take leads and work thousands of customers and create appointments, and then you know as I advanced in my career, I was allowed to wear ties and shirts and things of that nature. So we got. Uh, once we go Highline, uh, the first picture was Toyota, so once we go Highline, of course, it changes. But, but I've been there, so I, I always want to understand and I explain I'm coming from the perspective um, of sympathy for 
the monotony of the job. So many of you and most of you on this call today are active practitioners. You're front line. You're, you're whether leading the charge in a, in a management role, director role, which still usually involves talking to customers and creating engagement, or you're literally the person that's making the phone call, um, that's doing the meet and greet, that's selling the car from start to finish. So that's where I come from. Always come from a place of how does it matter to us at the retail level and, and how do we make a difference there. So let's jump in. So when I'm talking about number one, I'm talking about the idea of broken process. Your process is broken. Now, it's broken for a couple different reasons that I want to highlight here and, and where we typically find the broken process. The, the thing that I think a lot of times we miss is that everyone's intention is usually very, very good. I have not met anybody at a dealership in any part of the country where they said to me, Corey, I'm intentionally trying to not sell cars. We're intentionally trying to make customers angry. We're intentionally trying to deliver a poor experience. We're intentionally trying to sabotage our CRM. So everyone comes from a, uh, everyone usually comes from the right place of wanting to do well, be successful, sell more cars, service customers, make customers happy. Yet, we all come from that place, or the majority of us do, right? Yet, we're not always successful at the execution of that. And I think that's going to be a key where I talk about broken process. Because sometimes, in many cases, it's not the obvious that you're dealing with. So let me give you an example when I talk about broken process. So this is, uh, you know, truth is stranger than fiction, right? So. So this is a real lead uh, back in October uh, when my wife and I were looking at Hondas um, for an extra car. And, you know, I don't, it's like I'm not, hey, I don't work with everybody, so everybody's not my client. So everyone doesn't know who I am, and I don't take on that approach. You know, some walk in the store, I'm, you know, I'm Corey Mosley. Uh, automotive uh, extraordinaire. So I like to see the customer experience because if you read my articles or, or any of my videos and stuff, you know really that's, I, I like to see what the experience is. So, you know, I do what your customers do. Go to the website, put in a lead, put my telephone number in, put my, you know, put, put my information in as an intent to buy um, with high intent. So this wasn't a mystery shop or something that we facilitated for a client or you know, some random, you know, email to waste somebody's time. This was, hey, we're looking at this, and um, here's what we got. So as you can see on the screen is my wife's name. That's my wife's name there for you wondering uh, how to pronounce or say that name. I'm still working on it myself. But that's her name. So here's the email. This is literally the email. Not pulled out. Nothing's been augmented except, of course, we've taken the store out. I don't want to embarrass anybody. They might be on the call today. But... Thanks so much for your interest. I'm tied up right now with the customer, but I wanted to let you know that I did get your request. I'll be calling you shortly as soon as I free up. So when I talk about intent and I talk about broken process, you could probably agree with me that the goal here for this internet manager was to simply let me know that he got my lead, which in 2015, you know, with CRMs in 2017, it's probably reasonable that, that you know, lead forms get to the end destination. But he wanted me to know that. He wanted me to know that he's not able to talk to me right now, um, but that, you know, he is looking forward to helping me. So if you go intent, and this is what's dangerous, if you go with intent, he believes his intent is good. He believes that this communication conveys the message that he wants to convey. And somebody in management, assumably, um, has looked at the templates or looked at the emails that he's sending out in the CRM, and this has made sense to them. Now, as you step into the role of you're basically stepping out of the frame here, as you read this email as a customer, I think it tells a completely different tale and delivers a completely different message. And that's the danger. So when I talk to stores about process or I talk to stores about messaging, you may think your messaging makes complete sense to you. You may think it makes sense to you in your mind. Have you, have you ever sent an email out and there were words missing, but when you were saying it to yourself and typing it, you, you read it back to yourself because your mind knew what it was supposed to say, but it didn't? All and that's time. happened to a lot of us, right? All mm -hmm. the time. So, so this is one of those areas. So I'm challenging you, and my challenge to you when I talk about broken process 
is to look past the things you think you can check off as okay. So a lot of times we treat process in the store as Ron Popeil treats the rotisserie chicken. And if you don't know who Ron Popeil is, Ron Popeil is the guy who trademarked and coined the phrase, set it and forget it. So have you ever seen an infomercial? I was if you can't sleep, totally wondering asleep. where you were going with that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So at 3.30 in the morning, he's got the rotisserie, right? And he's like, all you need to do is put the chicken in and set it and forget it. He trademarked that term. And that's how we treat a lot of the processes. We go, all right, great, Corey, we got, 20, we, we got an autoresponder, we got our left message, we got, we got our 22 emails that we need, check the box, and then they never get looked at again, they never get reevaluated. Okay, great, we've got our process, we're going to follow up with a customer until they die, um, that's in, great, check the box. So I'm challenging you to not let this happen because this is happening arguably with what? The three, four, five hundred leads that this Honda store, this high volume Honda store may have coming in. How many customers look at this, engage with this type of messaging? And you may say, Corey, no, I mean, we would never send anything terrible like that. Okay, what are you sending? And when's the last time you've looked at it? And how does it translate from the customer's end? So that's my challenge here because intent, his intent was perfectly fine. All right. When we talk about the strategy, are, are, you, are you working based on the golden rule? Are you working based on this strategy of moving a customer through the process? Because there are a lot of people that believe different things. And for you, all my ask is, is if what I'm saying makes sense and you're not executing on it, maybe you want to try it. Uh, you know, I have a lot of colleagues and people I'm very friendly with. And by and large, we're 90% on the same page with each other, but there's a 10% variant on where we think something maybe should be done a slightly different. But my belief system has always been the, the golden rule of uh, internet sales execution is moving a customer from email to phone through the showroom. Does this mean you can't sell a car on email? Does this mean you can't close a deal on the phone? Absolutely not. I build processes based on the majority of the public, not the unique individual not the customer who singularly, yes, wants to do business that way. It's about what is the largest scale? How do we best serve the 300, 400, 500, 600 leads, 1,000 leads if you're a big store or if you're overbuying for that matter? How do we serve those people in that way? So if, you, if I was with you visually right now um, and in person, I'd be holding, imagine me holding my arms out. I'm holding my arms out right now full width apart. The theory is you got to go wide. I want you to go wide, and then you make adjustments as you get more narrow with your customers' needs. But I want to build the largest process, the most wide process possible to be able to catch them. So I have to be thinking about my logical next strategy in, in my process as it, as it relates to moving that customer throughout that process. A lot of times we get too focused on using the email, and you know the statistics on email. I mean, email is getting so so tough to, to penetrate the marketplace, which is why, of course, text messaging and now push notifications um, are becoming so significant. Because I got, who, who doesn't have push notifications going off all day long on your phone? Whether it's, now I'm getting the Wall Street Journal, I'm getting CNN sending me stuff, I got push notifications from every credit card I have. So push notifications and, of course, text messaging. So email is tough. Even the greatest emails, right, still have those deliverability issues. Sometimes you don't even know about them as it relates to blacklisting and things of that nature. So I always get concerned when people put too much emphasis on trying to make or close their deal by email or even trying to work that process of the phone. Ultimately, we have to get them in front of us, but we have to do it, of course, in a more sophisticated manner than just, hey, come on down. So as part of that process, the other thing that we see is we see a lot of people very common where the gold star is, they do a great job in that gold star number. That gold star number is that out of the shoot, week one, what you're going to do for the first seven days, that's where we see a lot of the wins. Like people are on it, right? So we have some people the super militant, you know, all oh, core, we call them three times a day, every day, we don't leave a voicemail, we keep hammering them. That's a little bit much for me, but... Uh, you have to decide ultimately what's working for you, but that gold star area, we, we kind of get effective because we're excited. We want to jump on top of it. If you're an aggressive store, you're really on it. If you're less passive, you still are calling because you're hoping for that you know, low-hanging fruit. You're hoping for that quick in-market buyer. And where we see, by and large, most stores have trouble 
is what happens once we flush through those initial people who were ready to buy, uh, what happens after we get through those people in the second or third weeks, what happens when we get down to that kind of nitty gritty area, which is they're really baked into your CRM at this point. If you're working any kind of lead volume, right, you've got you, your leads are constantly coming in, your to-do list constantly has activities in it between emails, uh, between uh, phone calls that need to be made or other steps in the process where you need to get back or engage the customer. So our to-do lists are super, super full. So where we fall off, it's very, very tough as you get into this 60-day, 90-day, and then you can, get, you can even go with your six-month follow-up, but let's stay on this core. It gets really tough there because those people are generally buried deep into that CRM as it relates to your to-do list and your work plan. And if you constantly work in this kind of first in, you know, type scenario, first in, last out kind of deal, you're you're constantly in this in this mindset. So what I would be asking everybody to do is to re-examine that area in particular, that week seven, that 43, 60, 90 day model inside your process to make sure that it is strong as possible, to make sure you haven't simply given up um, or gone to simply email broadcasts. So, Corey, we follow up, buy or die here at my store, you know. I'll email them until they opt out. Okay, that's great, but that's not obviously very strategic. And every statistic, whoever's data you like, um, whatever report you like, um, I report on this a lot on my show, like different, different reports. And a lot of them have contradictory information. Um, this week's show, I think I'm, I'm, um, I'm reporting on a um, report that came out from Accenture on uh, consumer buying habits and statistics on that. So whatever you believe statistic-wise, universally we've kind, of, we've kind of settled into this idea that our buyers are easily um, going into a three-month, four-month category in terms of when they're actually completing purchases. That's what most of the data will tell us once you get past the initial gold star wave. So it's a great opportunity now. We're still fresh into the year. We're still in first quarter to look at inside that process model what, what do you have for people in that 45, 60, 90 day? What do you have set up there? What are the communications? What do they look like? How many phone calls are you making? What becomes ideal there? Because you want to look at ways that you can strengthen that process because um, that's a key area where we see deals get lost or we see defection. So you know, through some of our data partners, we can see right that that lead came in here, but then it ended, they ended up buying over here six months later. Well, how did that happen? So if I go back in the CRM, okay, well, we really stopped calling them. We ran out of follow-up ideas. We ran out of creative messages to send. We, we, we ran out of a lot of those options there. So that's going to be one of those key areas. Here's some things you need to ask yourself. Do you understand the marketing concept known as TOMA? TOMA stands for Top of Mind Awareness. What steps are you taking right now? And I'm going to give you some resources at the end to, to work with you uh, on this. But what are you doing right now to understand and execute on a top of mind awareness strategy? And what are you doing right now to stay in front of those customers in a strategic way? Not just, I can't tell you how often an internet lead will start uh, for a new car and then turn into emails about service. Because, you know, we've taken an email address in the CRM, started as an interest on a, on a new vehicle, and then you send out some communications, and then all of a sudden, four months later, it's, hey, now it's time to winterize your car, get it ready. And I'm still a prospect, new car customer, but it all got mixed in together. So are you really creating top of mind awareness or are you pushing out communications that are working against you because consumers are losing confidence? Grammar, semantics, we all make, now, the key here is we all make mistakes. So nobody's perfect with grammar. There could be something misspelled in this deck. But the question is, when you're presenting with repetition, and that's what email communications are, repetitive, repetitive templates that are going off to customers, that's where it's dangerous. You know, we started using a new email, uh, email system a, a month or two ago, and we had an email go out, and it had uh, the, the drop-in for name, and we, we realized that when the name was not representative, it still had the icon there for where name would go, right? So honest mistake, I'm sure it happens to people, um, people who never, people who read our stuff and never respond took the opportunity to respond to that one to let us know we had made a mistake on the, on the email, but that was a one-time deal. 
So that didn't happen again. We learned from it. I'm concerned for the 27 templates you have in your database right now that are going out to every single customer who's coming in where you want to be the premier Nissan dealer or the premier Toyota dealer and you're using the wrong spelling for premier. <laughs> you're using the terminology for a movie premiere, not premier as in the best. So those are my concerns. My concerns are when, uh, when we've clearly misspelled things or uh, templates are not working and they're going out to a large group of people. And this is another opportunity. Because here's what we don't have. Most of us, we don't have technology. There's a lot of great technology. I just came back from an ADA, a lot of great technology out there. But I've yet to see the technology that tells you when a customer has decided not to do business with you for some reason that you can't track. So does somebody get that email like I got earlier and go, what's wrong with this guy? Well, I mean, why bother him? Send me an email telling me he's busy and he'll get to me when he feels like it. I'm not doing business there. See, he'll never know. That guy, Marty will never know. That salesman will never know that he turned us off or why he turned us off or what happened there. Do you know the difference between effective and persuasive communications? So a lot of you uh, write communications that will be considered effective but not persuasive. So to highlight that, effective communications explain persuasive communications sell, right? Sounds simple enough, but now I challenge you. Go back to your library of communications that you're sending out to customers. Are you simply explaining information? Or are you persuading them to actually take action? And I think knowing the difference is going to be pretty key. One way I always highlight this as a kind of an analogy is, you know, when you get that credit card invitation in the mail, right, it's all fantastic, 50,000 bonus points, you're going to Aruba, we love you so much, it's every, every, everything is beautiful, and then you get the card, right? That was the persuasive part. And then you sign up, you get the credit card in the mail, and then in it comes this thick piece of paper, right, that folds down accordion style to the floor, and it's the terms and conditions. Well, those are the effective communications. Those are the communications that explain that really you don't get those points and there's blackout dates and we're going to come take you and your children if you're ever late on the payment, <laughs> and it tells you all these other things, right, that, that go along there. So your communications right now, are they effective inside your process or are they persuasive? What's your pricing strategy? Are your emails relevant? Do you have clear direction? These are the hard questions that have to be asked. When I talk about a pricing strategy, so right now, somebody right now on this call somewhere listening is working in a store, whether on the front line or in a management capacity, that didn't want to discount the thing for the last 15 days, didn't want to get aggressive on the thing for the last 15 days, that is now going to come out of a meeting tomorrow or a Saturday morning meeting or a Monday morning meeting coming up where the conversation is going to be, do whatever we got to do. You know, we gotta, we gotta, we're, we're behind for the month. We've got to move some units. Uh, give them away or whatever the language becomes, right? Because there really wasn't a consistent. I guess that is a strategy. No strategy is a strategy also, by the way. But is there a consistent pricing strategy and execution strategy? And there is no one, and, and the key here is there's no one, one answer. Because you can be a volume store uh, where, you're, where, where individual growth is not as important to you because there are other factors that drive the decision making, or you could be a growth store. So it is important that you know, anybody ever shows up and tells you this is the only way to execute a strategy or the only way to sell a car online, I, have to, I always have concern for that. Because you ultimately have to sell into what, what, what you can execute successfully on. But the question is, is there a pricing strategy? Are the communications you're sending out now, are they considered relevant or deemed relevant? Is there a clear direction uh, to where you're going? Or is it kind of just like, hey, what, what, what can we do to sell you a car? Those are going to become some important questions. Eliana, we got a poll? Yes, we do. Our first of four poll questions is on your screen now. Audience, we love it when you get involved with our poll questions. It really lets us know what's happening all over the country. So the question is, have you asked yourself the effective versus persuasive question when building your templates? Oh, when building your template library, please select one of the following. Yes, all the time, effective, persuasive, all the time. Um, yes, but only sometimes. No, I it's just write templates. You can tell the truth. <laughs> yeah. Tell the truth. No, I just write templates that I think sound good. No, never. I don't even know what you're talking about. Or, um, no, 
but I do know I think I might need some better templates. Okay, once we get a majority of the votes in, we're going to close this poll and share the results. And yes, questions are already starting to roll in for you, Corey. So audience... Can I just say that? Can I tell them that you came up with the fancy? I was just like, yes or no, and she wanted to get fancy. So <laughs> I'm just revealing that little, that little behind the scenes tidbit. Don't give away all my secrets, Corey. Yes, I'm the fancy one in this relationship. Okay, so <laughs> once we get a majority of the votes in, we're, we're going to close this poll and share the results. Have you asked yourself, effective or persuasive when building your template library? Yes, all the time. Yes, but only sometimes. Nope, I just write templates I think sound good. Nah, that's too much work. I don't even know what you're talking about, effective versus persuasive, or no. I obviously need better templates. So, Corey, when you're ready, I will close this poll, and we'll see what the audience had to say. I'm ready because i got a ton more to get to. It's 1230, right? <laughs> I know, right? All right, here we go. 21% of today's audience said, yeah, all the time they're asking themselves effective versus persuasive. 21%. But the majority, 47%, almost half, said yes, but admittedly, they only do it sometimes. Now, 16% of today's audience say they just write templates they think sound good. 5% of today's audience say never, they don't know what we're talking about. And the remaining 11% of today's audience, well, they just think they need better templates. So, so here's the kicker. So, so here's what I love, and that's great. Thank you for the honest feedback. Um, I'm going to make sure I mystery shop the yes all the time people for sure. But <laughs> the 16% the, the that were like, yeah, I write templates. I just, I mean, they were like, no, but I write templates. I think sound good. So that's Marty. That's the guy in the first email that I showed. Marty thinks that email was fine. That there was nothing wrong with that. So those are the people that I'm really any, the the sixteen percent, and then the last two categories. Of course, there's opportunity for you to get better. But those are the people I'm really I really want to reach because they're the ones that are going. This sounds great. Put it out there and hoping that that it is. So. Um, that's just one of those interesting things to to think about. Okay. Okay. So next up, phone strategy. I want to talk about that for a second. I don't know what happened to my mouth. Um, so when we talk about phone strategy, because we're kind of talking about emails, effective versus persuasive. We're, we're kind of talking about some of those factors here. Now, when I talk about that in the sense of phones, are you executing on points of control? What I mean by points of control, you might refer to this as a rebuttal, but points of control are the areas in that call, you know, the opening, the setup for the appointment, the confirmation period. Do you understand those key points of control in the messaging? Do you have, what's the contingency plan? So when a customer doesn't go in the direction you want them to go, what, what is the next step? What activates at that point? What is your, what, you know, what is your go-to phrase or go-to statement? What's the pricing strategy on the phone side? So if in, in that phone conversation, is it let me check on my manager, let me get back, what's the pricing strategy? Or are you in the same kind of debacle where time of day, time of week, time of month dictates that? Do you define or are you defining the purpose of the interaction? How are you creating relevancy to the conversation? So yes, high level. High level is when I talk to a customer, I want to get them in. You know, if I ask a general manager, what do you what do you want from your BDC and then department? Get more people in the door. And then we don't really complete the sentence, and that creates a challenge because is it relevant? What what are the actions that we're taking? Is there a train involved? What tools can you use? Is there scarcity on the vehicle that you can use as a tool? Uh, can you move to the trade and talk about how to how, how to move in that direction? What is the purpose of the interaction? And how are you making conversations relevant to individual prospects? Uh, when we talk about personality traits in a second, I'll, uh, this this will kind of give you a broader view on this statement when I talk about relevancy, uh, because that's going to be key. So often, we're just making phone calls to make phone calls, right? We're making phone calls. We're trying to hit our number. Um, I know guys, colleagues, friends of mine uh, who, who are in store and do training, and you know they they will post up. You know how many call? Oh man, we rocked it! We did twelve hundred calls today. We, you know, we just killed it. All, all we got all the tracking boards and all that's great. I'm not knocking any of that. I'm just making the point that does it create manif does it to a certain extent does it create manifest a scenario where we're that's what we're trying to do? We're 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 trying to put post numbers up uh, so significantly. We're so focused on that, and we're trying to get through phone calls versus execute on the call. 
that's two different things. The execution of that call is different than trying to make phone calls. Oh, well, I'm, I, you know, I'm running a contest. Whoever can make the most calls today, they're going to win. So now we put this emphasis um, on the activity, not necessarily the execution. I hear people blowing through phone calls all the time. We listen to calls. We listen to voicemails. I hear people blowing through calls. I hear people hanging up the phone. You ever had that phone, right? The you, you dial on speakerphone, and then you get the person's voicemail, and it hits beep, and then you're scrambling to pick up the phone and then leave the message. So you can hear all that. Or you hear people leaving a message, and they're hanging up. They're basically mo move the phone from their mouth to hang up the phone um, before they complete the voicemail. Somebody's looking at each other right now in their store right now going, oh, my God, I know I do that. Because you're so focused on getting through, um, and it's not necessarily relevant. Also. What's the, script, what's the script look like? So there's people who hate scripts and love scripts. The key here is you've got to get consistency. If you're running a, a multi-person BDC or internet operation, then the idea that you don't need some kind of platform for consistency um, is going to leave you to have conversations like people have with me all the time. Well, I've got five people, and you know John and Jackie, they're great, but I, I wish I could get the other three to be like John and Jackie, and then you find that they're all kind of doing their own thing in this freestyle way. So I'm all for organized communications. The key is, um, you know, what what's the relevancy of that? You know, I was in a I was in a dealership recently, and they were telling me about all the training they do, and you know, they got these posters on the wall and everything, and with quotes on it, and and you know, you know, sales training quotes. And I went over to the poster and I looked at the copyright date, and the copyright date said 1978 on it. So. My challenge is not only what are the communications that you have, but what's the age of them? What's the refresh rate on uh, on some of this stuff? And I think that's you know something that we need to be thinking about. All right. Number two, number two, number two, number two. Number two is not knowing thy customer. Not knowing thy customer. So all too often, we execute. We do a very good execution job, many of you out there. We execute on these customers that fit very well in our box. So customers who can align with us, uh, customers who um, you know fit kind of maybe our personality. And when you think about traditional buyer psychology, how does the customer end up kind of in the internet world, right? Um, you know, researching, coming through the leads. Are they internet tough guys? Um, a internet manager in, in Texas at a Honda store he coined that phrase, uh, so I, I've, I've picked it up. Internet tough guys, people who hide behind the computer. But when you think about bio psychology, previous bad experience, I mean, stuff happened, right? I mean, you think about history. If you've been in this business for any time, you think about the stories of people calling 911 from the dealership. Like, what could possibly be happening at the dealership that the customer has to call 911? And I'm not talking about one offs. There's a dealer group that's no longer in business where in 90 days they had like four or five 911 calls. Uh, that's really crazy. What? So in terms of business practices, yeah, and, and what you could be doing. They're out of business now. Uh, <laughs> shocker. <laughs> Spoiler alert. They're out of business. But there are things that simply happen, right? So I always say this in the automotive industry. It's not who we are that gets held against us. It's what we do. So you have customers, previous bad experience, people that know their laydowns. I mean, there are people that know they're easy to sell. I'm a guy that's easy to sell. If I go to a store and you know can afford to buy the items that are in the store, typically, um, you know, somebody says hello to me, I'm pretty much committed to buy something at that point. It, it really, it really is that it really is that uh, is that simple. And you know, what do they say? The first rule of kind of like addiction and stuff, right? Is to is to admit your problem. So so people out there know they know they go into a car dealership. You've got popcorn and gongs, and you've got you know uh, uh, you've got area. Area 33 from Sirius Radio pumping through the through the system, and everybody's jamming in there. You're, you're banging gongs and giving ice cream, and the kids have coloring books. You're doing all this stuff to create excitement and culture and, and experience. They know they're going to close up, so they stay back. You got customers that want to be in control. You have customers that are very busy. You have customers that live an internet lifestyle. This is ultimately how they communicate, right? They're Eliana. You on Marco Polo? Am I on Marco Polo? Yeah. <laughs> you ever heard of that? Ah. No. no, you're throwing out a lot of terminology I have never heard Marco before, Polo, my friend. Marco Polo, you have to get it. It's a, it's a, it's a new, it's a, it's a video walkie-talkie um, app. 
So we're all on what you know. So I've gotten like Kane and everybody on it. They're all on you know Marco Polo. But this is how people communicate. So I'm not. I don't even text some people anymore. I go on Marco Polo and I say hello to them. You know, in a video that way. So it's just this living a life. Uh, you know, that's a plug for Marco Polo. There you go. Um, Oh, well, you're but, not the only one. Apparently, some other people, like Heidi, she wrote it. I love Marco Polo. I have Marco got Polo. to check there this out. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Shout out to my wife who put me on the Marco Polo. But, um, <laughs> but, but my point is that's how they're communicating, so they're not even texting. It's like, okay, I want video. I want to talk to you. I want to see you, but I don't know if we need to do it, A, in real time, or we need to have an extended thing. So they're going there. They're just simply living in that lifestyle. So walking in, driving on the lot, or whatever, traditionally is not kind of their model. So, if you noticed in that, if you noticed in that though, it wasn't once the grind dealers in the dust. Like that wasn't the buyer psychology. So by and large, I'm talking about the the preponderance of the grouping of your customers, not the unique people you can think about. All of you right now on this call could think about some customer. You might have them right now, or last week, or last month, or three years ago. That yes, they wanted to grind you in the dust. You can think about a terrible experience where you know they just wanted to steal a car for, for whatever. Yeah, you can think about that, and you can do the flip side of that, right? I'll always rem I, I will remember, even though it was 17 years ago, I'll remember that $6,000 gross. I remember that customer taking me. Uh, I was very new in the business. That customer, $6,000 deal, big commission, first huge commission. They took me. They took me to dinner. After I was after I made a six thousand dollar gross CSI was a hundred percent. So you all remember we remember unique experiences, but I'm talking about the hundreds of leads that you're processing right now. By and large, the the the, the preponderance there wasn't this price grind you to dust kill you thing. Um, although there are people out there that are like that. Here's the other deal. The other deal is buyer personality. There's a lot of talk now in psychology. I have colleagues in the industry that, that focus on this like I do. But your ability to get so, get outside of your own box is going to be paramount uh, to your ability to, to execute a winning strategy and find more deals. I want to be very, very clear with everybody. I am all about incremental and sustainable growth. Anybody can uh, do a tent sale or an inventory reduction mailer and have a big weekend, and then you got to go back to business. I'm after the how can I get how can I get two or three more deals out for myself personally, and, and how that contributes to my income or my bonus level. And then as a manager, how can I get my people to squeeze out two or three more deals? And then as an owner, how can I get my whole team to do that exponentially, and then do it again and do it again and do it again. So these things I'm talking about today are not about, oh, we've, done, we've tripled our internet business. Um, this is, although we have done that for, for clients, but this is about how can we execute some incremental strategies where we can find deals that we're missing. You're missing deals right now if you are not familiar with identifying the three children, busy, perfect, uh, professional, hectic, scheduled person, the, the person who doesn't trust dealerships, who is, is looking for all the third-party credibility they can find, uh, customers who want to be remembered, want to tell you about their vacation. If you're not able to engage these people in your team, engage and adjust is the key. I'm not talking about lying or chameleon or pretending to be like them. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about being able to adjust your approach not in a fake way, in an authentic way, but identifying who you're working with. Now, your key, you've got to do this quick. You've got to have, you've got to be on, you know, the phone or engaged 20 seconds, 30 seconds, hear the, some of the first words out of that customer's mouth to determine where you need to be in terms of the conversation. Is it push time? Is it pull time? Uh, what are those do's and don'ts? And we talk about this in some of our expanded curriculum, but I pose the question to you, what buyer are you, and how are you actively responding now to these types of buyers? I think that's a poll question. I think it is. Thank you very much, Mr. Oh. Mosley. Okay, audience, your second poll question is on the screen. We want to know, do you think that you are missing deals because of a failure to adjust your approach based on different buyer personalities? Please select one of the following. Yes, yeah, we probably are. We really have to work on that. Maybe we don't really know how to make those adjustments, though. 
No, no way. Wait. Wait a minute. Maybe a few. I love these. I love these. I love these. <laughs> No, we're not missing any deals. A sale is a sale. They're all the same. Every person who walks in is all the same. Or how about the last answer? No, the old way has always worked for us. Why change now? Oh, yeah, I've heard that one before, too. Okay, so once we get a majority of the votes in, we'll close this poll and <laughs> share the results. <laughs> uh, Kendra wrote in, I need a poll answer of already adjusting to buyer personalities for the most part. <laughs> okay. Well, what was that? Uh, what was that? Um, that she, Kendra says she's already adjusting to those buyer personalities for the most part. So you don't feel like you're missing deals because of different buyer personalities because you're already doing it. You're right. I should have had that answer. Corey, see, I told you. No, this is great. I love this. Because like, you know what? Nah, no way. Nah. <laughs> Nah, no way. <laughs> Wait, maybe a few. I, that's so you. I love it. That's great. <laughs> You know what? Because I recognize that I have different personalities that come to my show. So thank you very much, audience, for proving me right. All right. Let's close this poll and share the results if you're ready. Um, okay. <laughs> oh, well, let me get to this one. Ron wrote in, we are missing deals if the salespeople are not trained very well by their managers. Why, well, thank you for that, Ron. Mm. Are you telling? There we go. I wonder, I wonder who handles that. I wonder who we could call to fix that. I don't know. <laughs> Don't know. They said, know anybody. Okay, let's roll. Okay, let's go. Well, 50, I, I got to get to a whole other thing. Okay, here we go. 57% of today's audience, Ooh. the majority, says, yes, we are missing deals. We really have to work on that. 31% of today's audience says, maybe, but we don't really know how to make those adjustments. 9% of today's audience said, nah, no way. Wait, all right, maybe a few. 3% of today's audience says, no, a sale is a sale. They're all the same. And believe it or not, no one picked the last one. The old way has always worked for us. Why change now? Well, I believe that because progressive people don't uh, – pro, I mean, pro, people who are old or super old school, they're not even on this call. I mean, this is way too progressive for them to even be on the call. So, you know, progressive people attract progressive people. So I wouldn't expect – that doesn't surprise me at all because – you know, the, the, the people who are committed to education are on this call right now or are going to be on the replay. Um, so that doesn't surprise me at all. Okay, so the questions that are coming up, though, is, okay, so first, how do you identify those different groups? And then second, how do you make those adjustments? Those are the questions yeah, that so, we got Well, let, let me get, let, let's, you want to hold that? Let me hold, I'll comment on that as best I can in the time. But let's, uh, let me wrap up on this third one, and then, Elian, I'll let you bring that back up, okay. and I'll expound on it. Sounds okay? fair. Okay, cool. All right. So here's a couple things that I think we have to remember. Uh, one of the things we have to remember is that the head is attached to the price. And why this is important, it's important because of how we communicate. When we communicate in a way where we ask customers intellectual questions, we ask them, "What do you think about that? What do you think? What do you think about the test drive? What do you think about the car? What do you What do you think about those numbers?" And you put your customers. The beauty of this is this is psychology in itself. So this isn't automotive psychology, or you know, or or there's different psychology for the electronic industry or the pharmaceutical industry. This is ultimately tapping into how people think. And if we ask questions that create an analytical thought process, then we allow them to stay completely in control from the standpoint of how they're thinking and how they're responding. So they can process differently, and that makes it tougher for us to close deals and or protect profit. But when we think about the heart being attached to the wallet, it's a different story. It's an emotional connection. Now, you might say, Cora, oh, well, you know, of course, that makes sense. I know emotional connection. and I get it 100%. For me, a lot of times, it's never whether you've heard something before or never if you understand the concept. It all comes down to execution. So yes, you probably would agree with me that this makes complete sense. The heart is attached to the wallet. Emotional decisions help uh, close deals and get people excited, and you believe in all of that. I'm going to say majority of you believe in all of that. That's great. My next question is, how do you and your teams execute on that? Because if the next customer you talk to or you go present information to and you say, what do you think about those numbers? And they go, they're too high. 
Well, again, you are you're not executing on on a heart based decision making or emotion based uh, strategy at that point. So you have to go back and think about your words. Again, there's only so much we can get to in an hour here, but the key is I want to set you on the path to get off this call and go. What are some of our go-to phrases? What are some of the key things that we ask? Are we communicating uh, in a heart attached to wallet mentality, or are we communicating in a uh, thought process, thought pattern that makes them think, and is that hurting us? Is that hurting our incremental deals? So in my mind, email communications, add a deal. Uh, get phone communications, add a deal. Buyer personalities, add a deal. Change language from analytical thought-based to heart-based or emotion-based language, add a deal. That's when I talk about incremental growth. And all of a sudden, from those small changes, I, I found four deals as an individual, potentially. Oh, quick, let's do this one really quick because i got to get to number three, um, Eliana. Yes, sir. Okay, so do you or your team use more head-based language instead of heart-based language? Please select one. I definitely use more head-based language, slightly more head-based language, definitely more heart-based language, slightly more heart-based language, or, oh, geez, I have no idea. Depends on what day it is. Once we get a majority of the votes in, we're going to close this poll and share the results. Of course, I want to remind the audience that we're getting to the Q&A session very shortly. So if you have questions for the great Corey Mosley, send those oh. questions in so we can get those answered because we are looking forward to helping you solve those three mistakes, killing your online sales. And the votes are still coming in. Audience, you're doing so great with these poll questions. Thank you so much. I think out of all of the poll questions, this is the one you're going to be most surprised by, the answers, Corey. Because okay. I'm, I'm watching these votes come in, and I am surprised, actually. So Close the poll. I close the bowl. Well, the votes are still coming in. Audience, you guys are great. Thank okay. you so much. All right. A uh, couple more seconds, then we're going to close this poll. Here we go. All right. Here we go. It's it's like a split mm. five ways. All right. So 21% of today's audience say they definitely use more head-based language. 18% yeah. said slightly more head-based language. 21% said definitely more head-based, heart-based language. Another 21% said slightly more heart-based language. And then 18% said, geez, I have no idea. It depends on the day. So it is like as evenly five-way split probably as you can get on one of these poll questions. Well, it, so, were, so were you surprised by that? Because I am. No, no, no I'm, not, I'm not really surprised. And again, well, the only thing I'll, the caveat I'll give is if I've got a director on here who's speaking for his team, that may skew the numbers ultimately. In his mind or her mind, they may be executing uh, a, a, a heart-based you know, communication pattern um, or think that one's taking place. So, but no, this doesn't surprise me. And again, more progressive people. But it proves my point about what I want to accomplish in the time we had today is that you can visual. Now, unless you say, Corey, you're crazy, emotion-based language or, or getting people emotionally involved, um, doesn't help deals. Now, unless you don't believe that, then that whole 39% now can leave this call with information they didn't have before, with a strategy they didn't have before, and that's always my goal. Yeah, but if you have the guy who has the personality where he doesn't, you know, believe, you know, uh, you know, you had one of those personalities who was kind of a hardline guy, and he just wanted mm -hmm. to know the numbers, and he doesn't really trust dealerships. Don't you want to talk to him more head-based language than heart-based? Is heart-based really going to work for a guy like that? Yeah, but here's the key. You can go back to the person. This is about going wide. You're asking me about a unique situation. That's not what I'm talking about. Oh. So I'm talking about the overall strategy. So overall, I'm better off tapping into a customer's emotional decision. And even analytical people, there are analytical people who try to think they're going to be analytical or think they're going to be tough about a situation i.e., I'm just looking, and then they're spotted in 45 minutes, or they're spotted two hours later leaving the dealership. They, there are people who put up phase one, which is let me stay away, let me you know, stay away from me. When I talk about buyer psychology, right, a laydown comes on the lot. He's going to say just looking, not making any decisions right now, not because it's true in many instances, but because that's the pushback from I want to stop you from trying to engage me or trying to make me like you. So, again, I'm not talking about that 
percentage of customer, then that's fine. You make the adjustment. But I don't want to start that way. That's how I right. think you hurt yourself. Right, so, right. All right, number three. Number three, um, the last one, trying to leverage intangible benefits. Let me explain what I'm talking about there. Is by now, I started doing workshops in 2005. That was our first workshop series, the online sales success workshop. And it's concerning to me <laughs> that some of the challenges I see today are still challenges that we talked about in 2005. And one of those things is this idea and concept of the why buy, the unique selling proposition, whatever you want to, whatever you uh, you want to call it. While many many stores have made tremendous strides in kind of getting one, there's still this miscommunication on what actually is supposed to be in a why buy or what actually is um, is enticing or converting for the customer. So the key here, and I want to talk about, is this idea of intangible versus tangible. So I want you to be proud of all the things your dealership's done. If you're the oldest dealer, you've been around for 100 years, I want you to be proud of all of that. But here's the key, I want you to make the leap from what is tangible versus what is intangible when it comes to attracting a customer. I talk to customers all the time in showrooms. They come out of F&I, they buy cars, they're taking delivery. I have never in 13 years of doing that had a customer say to me, Corey, you know, the one thing that pushed me over the hedge here, you know, I was undecided, but I gotta tell you, seeing that president's award in the corner really pushed me over the edge and made me make the decision <laughs> to buy this car. I've never met anybody tell me that. So I don't want to. I don't. People confuse pride with with actionable things that influence customers. So telling me that your people are nice is not an influence factor, as opposed to what nasty, mean. Who who would tell me that? Who would go? Who would advertise? Come buy a car from us. We hate our customers. Nobody, right? It's silly to even think about. So, when you tell me how big you are, or how much property you have, or how much inventory you have, or how long you've been around, listen. If it, the majority of dealerships in the country are family-owned and operated, so I don't understand the competitive advantage there. Um, and if family-owned and operated was really what mattered, then of course the public groups of the world would be struggling. Walmart wouldn't exist. Um, and all of the small businesses that they arguably put out of business when they come into a town, uh, none of that would happen. So I'm, f I'm asking you to focus on tangibles. Now, of course, you'll ask me what are tangibles. So, you know, tangibles need, there's a, a myriad of things that create tangibles, but tangibles have to be hard items. Are there discounted things? Are there things you're including in the deal? You're giving away. Do you have a points program? Do you have a, do you, do, it has to be something that is tangible to the customer. Can they touch, feel, taste it? Is it an inspection? Is it a car wash? Is it, what is it that has to be tangible? Because intangibles, you, you tout those and they do nothing. And you put energy into touting them. You know, I watched the dealer put a ton of money into a commercial that was 50th anniversary of the dealership. And they put a ton of money into promoting that. Now, do you want to be proud of that? If you said to me, hey, we did it, we had the money, we're proud, and we want to tell everybody how proud we are to be at 50 years, that's fine. But if you did it and then went, man, I, I don't understand why nobody came in on the ad, you, you, you've, you're missing the whole point of tangible versus intangible. So that's what I wanted to share there. Um, poll question. Yes. We got super fast. I want I to get them the research. Super fast. All right. Last poll question. Thinking about your current why buy message, are you guilty of having one or more intangibles attached to it? All right. So, yes, we have way too many. I thought they were working for us. Yes, but the owner really likes them. Maybe I'm not admitting to anything. Nope, not us. We don't even have a why buy message. What are you talking about? You're giving us way too much credit. All right. I'm seeing these for the first time, so that's funny. <laughs> you crack me up. I'm not to anything. Who clicks that? Somebody's going to click that to be funny. but that's <laughs> uh, Somebody? Many people have clicked on it, my friend. <laughs> people Maybe are writing in. I clicked on it. Anything. I do. <laughs> so thank you for your honesty, audience. All right, so thinking about your current why by message, are you guilty of having one or more intangibles attached to it? Please select. Yes, we have way too many. I thought they were working for us. Yes, but the owner really likes them. Maybe, I'm not admitting to anything. Nope, not us, or we don't even have a why by message. 
but thank you for giving us that much credit. You know what? You know why I love you, Eliana? I love you because even though I'm like go fast, you're still going to repeat it twice. You're the still going to do it Dude, exactly. the votes are still you're coming in, Mosley. What do you want me to do? <laughs> <laughs> the votes are coming in, audience. Thank you so much for your votes. I heart you. All right, here we go. Let's see what the audience said. Oh, three-way tie. Twenty-three percent of the audience said yes. We have too many. Thought they were working. Twenty-three so percent. Twenty-three percent said yes, but the owner really likes them. Twenty-three percent said maybe. I'm not admitting to anything. Thirteen percent said nope, not us. And seventeen percent said we don't even have a why buy message. Huh, Corey? Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fearful and I'm excited because again, all these people leave this call shortly going. I have an opportunity that, that I have opportunities here, unless you completely disagree with me. Um, they all leave the call going, I have opportunities. Some people may confirm that they're doing all the right things, but other people, as, 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 uh, as attested to by these polls, get to say, man, there's some things that, that we could be doing to sell more cars, and I love that. I love it, too. All right, let's close right, this so, thing up. So, a couple closing. So taking action. Understand that practicality causes delay. Emotion will cause action. Your impact will drive your income. Average performers plan what to say. Top performers plan what to ask. Eliminate or differentiate yourself from the competition. Also, if you're in management and leadership in this call, understand you can't simply mandate productivity. Steve Jobs, amongst his many sayings, is one I love to keep. He said, you can't mandate productivity. It's an organization's responsibility to give its team the tools they need to be successful. So you can't just call a meeting and go, everybody sucks, or you need more appointments this weekend, or you're not selling enough cars, and then in the meeting. There has to be actionable content, actionable steps that need to take place for them to do it. And always, always, always be in the mode and mindset of focusing on your presentation. I want to leave you with some resources. So you have to do some work here. I'm not letting you cheat and just download it from the, uh, from the, the, the GoToWebinar panel. If you go to our site, moseyautomotive.com slash resources, uh, there's two pieces of resources. Number one is what we call an Internet Sales Rapid Assessment. It's a quick one-cheater that will help you highlight some things, effective versus persuasive, um, talk about some of your email communications, your processes. It's a do-it-yourself kind of form to just give you an idea, confirm you're doing great, show you where there might be some opportunities. And the other thing is, it's a the seven disciplines of internet sales success, it's a workbook based on our seven disciplines of internet sales success. So it's about a 10-page workbook or whatever that, um, again, do it yourself, you can work through it, give you some ideas. We don't spend enough time being proactive in our business. We're reactive. Here comes the lead. Let me take action. This is about strategy. So if you have the opportunity to get ahead of the game instead of chasing the game, I think everybody will be uh, better off. So those are two resources I want to share that you can get on our website. And what, what I'm going to do, I know you're going to get to the giveaways. I'm going to throw on a bonus here um, to the first. Yeah, you know how I do. I'm going to throw on a bonus here to the first 10 people um, who download any of either of the resources, uh, I'm going to pick um, three people from that 10. So look at the first 10 to qualify. I'm going to pick three people, and uh, my office will contact you, and we'll throw in one of our um, Keep Calm on the Closer shirts or one of our awesome mugs or a signed copy of my book. So I'm going to do that additionally wow. to those first 10 people who download. So Wow, very cool. People, Look at you coming up with some surprises and surprises. People already downloading. I love it. That's crazy. Um, people, people have already downloaded, yes. <laughs> they're not, they're playing, not around. playing around. If they're already popping in. They're not playing around. So um, I'm throwing it back to you, Eliana. Thank, thank, you, thank, you. thank you, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Go take a drink of water or whatever it is you're drinking, and let me talk to the audience. <laughs> A little bit. They're cranking. They're, I love it. They're cranking on the downloads. It's, it's, uh, I, yes, I know, because we have a lot of people on today. Okay, audience. Some people I know. Some people are trying to get some stuff that I already, I must have calling some names out that I already know them. Uh, they're, hey, they're re-downloading it. I just want you to know, I've known Corey for many years. He's never offered me a mug or a t-shirt, so I might have to go and download one. All right. Audience, I wanted, I do want to bring your attention over to the handouts section of the GoToWebinar interface. Now, it doesn't have those two cool handouts that Corey just told us about. That's true. But it does have today's slide deck in it. So if you'd like to download it, you do have until the end of today's broadcast in order to do so. And yes, let's bring it up one more time. MosleyAutomotive.com slash resources to let to get you to download those two awesome resources that Corey just told us about. 
I am not letting me download, but I've downloaded prior. All right, Kanitra, email me directly, and let me see if I can help you. It's Eliana at DealerOn.com. All right? All right, for everyone no, else. I know her. I know her. She's got all my stuff already. Yeah, but maybe, uh, she, maybe she wants the slide deck, that, babe. She wants that mug. She wants that mug. <laughs> she knows how to find me. <laughs> oh, Kanitra's laughing about I'm it, too. To to yeah, I'm coming to Texas to see her. Oh, yeah? Kanitra, you yeah. lucky girl. All right, here we go. Uh, she says hello, by the way. Oh, and she said, awesome. I know, I'm jealous too, right? Okay, so we're going to get to your questions. If you haven't gotten in your question yet for Corey, and Kanitra, this goes, to, I know you're going to be seeing him in like in person, but you can ask a question here too. It doesn't, I'm okay with that. I'm A okay with it. You know what? Let's turn on our webcams now, sir. We got let's some fun stuff, some fun stuff to give away as well. All right, let's give away something. Look how handsome. All right, here we go. Um, we're going to give away. Now, if you missed it at the beginning of the webinar, that's right. I told all love of you, you, want this you love it. two of you lucky you webinar this. attendees are going to win some really cool prizes. First, two lucky webinar attendees are going to win a private 30-minute coaching call slash strategy session with the Corey Mosley himself. You heard it. And fabulous prize. Awesome prize. You, uh, and if you win one of those, to coaching sessions, you will also get your choice of a t-shirt, a signed book, or a mug. Pictures of it on the screen now. I wish you the very best of luck. Of course, vendors, these prizes really aren't meant for you, so we would ask you to please bow out of this one. We love having you on the show, of course, but this prize is intended for dealership personnel only. All right. And, and vendors, use your real name when you download my stuff. It's okay. You can have it too. Just use, use your real info. <laughs> Thank you for that. All right, here we go. All you have to do is answer a simple question about today's presentation. Get ready. Get to your keyboards, everyone. First one to write in the correct response is going to be walking away with one of these cool prizes today. All right, here we go. Earlier, Corey talked about intangible why buy benefits. We want you to name two. Name two intangible why buy benefits. Name two, any two. Oh my God! Kanitra is our winner. <laughs> Kanitra wrote in three. <laughs> Kanitra, she wrote it. How long are you in business? Nice employees and car wash. <laughs> no, wait. Intangible. Intangible. Yes, intangible. Intangible. Why are you throwing stuff at me? Oh, how no. How long in business and nice employees? Kanitra, excellent okay. job on that. Kanitra, I also need you to find out. Yes, people are writing in family-owned, best selection, lifetime warranty, and service maintenance. Oh, actually, that's a really good one. I think you like this one because this is American Apparel. This is we did the good. We did them right on these. <laughs> Kanitra, I need you to write on in and let me know if you'd like the book, the mug, or the T-shirt. You are also I winning fun. yourself. This is fun. I like this. I have a lot. Of, I have a lot of fun today. Yeah, I'm glad. Yeah, I always love it when you have fun. Yeah. Um, we're also. You're also going to be walking away with a free 30-minute coaching session, strategy session with Corey Mosley another. himself. She was another. <laughs> <laughs> another. Um, by the way, Kanitra picked the t-shirt because she knows okay. she's already going to see you in she's Texas. Smart. That's right. She probably already has your book. <laughs> All right, Kanitra, right on in. Let me know what dealership you're from, of course. I know Corey already knows, but, you know, for the rest of us, <laughs> we'd all like to know. And also what size you'd like. All right, we have one more prize to give away. I know yeah, Brad... Brad is chomping at the bit. He feels he, <laughs> he needs to win every time he's on my show. So here we go. Good luck, Brad, and everyone Brad else as well. Too, so this, is, this is, uh, you, you had to have been paying attention early on in the show to get this one right. Oh, by the way, Kenitra's from Auto City in Dallas, Texas. She'd like an XL. All right, here we go. Good luck, everyone. One more prize to give away. What is the Internet sales golden rule? Go. Internet sales golden rule. First one to write in is going to be, who is it? No one's written in yet. What is the internet sales golden rule? Oh, my people did not listen. No, Brad hasn't written in yet. Somebody wrote in. Didn't Brad get it yet? No. <laughs> the internet sales golden rule. Okay, do you want me to help them? Somebody wrote in, really, Brad? <laughs> no one's you, you written me, in. You want I don't know. Do no, it's not. It's not. Oh, wait. Hold on. Somebody got it. Oh, okay. look at this. Let me. Let me. Who is this? Michael Poro. 
Email phone showroom. Correct. That's somebody new. Correct. That's somebody new. Michael, right. I'm writing your name down. Official. Michael, I don't think you've been a winner on my show yet. I don't recall your name. This, is it the U.S.? Because I'm not calling the Netherlands or somewhere. I know we're, I, I've got people, we've got people from like South Africa on here. I, I had to put the caveat. <laughs> I, I don't think my phone plan. You should have done it that. earlier, Corey. It's too bad now. All right, Michael, where are you yeah. from, babe? Michael, okay. let, let me know what dealership you're from and, and what part of the world you're in. <laughs> Michael says, I'm always a winner. <laughs> That's right. That's a good attitude. Is he a closer, though? Is he a closer? Oh, Brad wrote in. He says, stinking vendors calling during the giveaways. Darn it. <laughs> Brad, we were all expecting you to pull I this think, one out. What happened? I think, Brad, I think Brad was one of the first ten on the download. So he's got <laughs> another shot at winning something. So. <laughs> Michael is from Honda World in Louisville, and he is a closer. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, Michael, beautiful. congratulations. Shout out hey. to Michael from Honda. Yeah, Michael. Michael would, have never, Michael would have never sent that email out like that other Honda guy, right? I know that. No idea. I'm sure he wouldn't have. Um, <laughs> um, Michael, let me know if you'd like the book, the T-shirt, or the mug. And he, by the way, Michael says, never. And Brad wrote in, I'm just going to take Corey down when I see him at CBT. There you go. Uh, Michael wants the book, and he says, you better sign that bad boy. Mark that. Mark that. We got him. We got a fresh copy coming his way. All right. Thank you, okay. everyone, so for playing along. We really appreciate it. Of course, we're going to thank uh, everyone for playing along. And congratulations to Kanitra and Michael. You got some awesome prizes, you two. So enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. And come on back to another Dealer On webinar. Who knows, that'll be the day that you win a cool prize on a Dealer On webinar. But for right now, congratulations, Kanitra and Michael. And, of course, we've got to thank our good friends over at Mosley Automotive for their incredible generosity. Oh, this mug is so nice. It is oh, nice. You can, you can send mug. it to me Look in New Jersey. Mug. I will take the mug. Did you say no vendors? Uh, oh, we'll really? See what we can do. All right. If you hold it up and drink out of it on every webinar from now on, I, I drink on every webinar. I mean, I can do that for you. Okay. All right, yeah. next. <laughs> First question it came in early. It came in from Kendra. Kendra says, what about up to 180-day follow-ups? Just last month, I finally had a customer buy that I had originally been contacting since June. Oh, my goodness. How often do you think doing follow-up past three months is needed? I always go 180 days, and usually around the four- to six-month mark, I start seeing some sort of contact. It feels like you could lose a lot of customers not going the extra mile, even though Admittedly, it is time-consuming. That one comes in from Kendra. Right. So, I mean, no, she hit the nail. I mean, that's exactly what happens. You, you just have to – it's a long game, um, and that's a, a mistake a lot of people make when they come into that the, to the BDC or Internet field. They're not told the real story. They're not told. So they're all excited. They go and start making cold phone calls. Nobody calls them back, and then, uh, and then they get burnt out on the idea. Um, the, most the number one reason people don't do follow-up long term and that's great 180 days I have no problems with that I'm not you should be fall I'm, uh, I'm not advocating you stop following up after 90 days but the number one reason why people don't do long-term follow-up is they run out of things to say so where I would challenge everybody is to look at what their communication strategy is once you get past the low-hanging fruit once you start to get in that 90 120 um, 180 era once you start getting in that time frame what are you communicating with is it hey are you just still in the market Hey, I don't want to be a pest. I don't want to bug you. Just send me an email. Let me know. I can take you out of the system. That's that's kind of the number one problem. So I think she's spot on in keeping that going. But it's what is that communication strategy? Um, you know, outside of the immediate window where people might buy. Right. Absolutely, Kendra. Great question. Keep them coming. We love it. Okay. So back to what we talked about during the show, Corey. Sabrina was one of the people who wrote in. She says, okay, but how do you identify those different groups? And then, okay, yeah, yeah. and then, and then oh, how do you change course? You know? Oh, so, no, and, and so put it on the one with your picture on it so people have your contact information. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, please. Sure. Whatever you tell me to do. Okay. So, 
Wise man. It's easier. It's easier that way. <laughs> trust me. Um, so here's the here's the honest answer. The honest answer is I can't answer that question on this webinar. So we have. I mean, obviously, um, without shamefully self-promoting, of course, we go deeper into that area. Yes, there are specific things based on each of those personality types. Those personality types all have names, and they all have about a half dozen do's and do nots. So it's a training factor. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only person in the world who has the answer to it, but it is a training factor. What I wanted to accomplish here today was to set the tone to say, okay, here are, so download the deck so you understand these four buyers. Um, I hit the thing, my mistake. Uh, so you understand these kind of segmented buyers and start to look for those cues. But there's no way that I can't answer, I can't fully, I mean, that's a training course, really, um, a course of training that, that your team would need to be trained on in terms of here are the cues, here's the word choice. I mean, maybe for our next webinar together, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's on our, that's on our paid system, oh. uh, mostly 24-7, uh, houses, those, houses, those, houses that information. But, yeah, but, but literally, honestly, it is, there's kind of, there's a half dozen cues for each of those buyers that says, hey, when you execute or when you identify this customer, here's, your, here's what your pattern should be. Do this, you know, uh, uh, speak, you know, be direct, not, don't be vague. Don't, if it's this type of buyer, you need to give options, give time. So it's really just a function of a deeper training that you would need to go through to, to answer that question. And you know where to contact them. All right, <laughs> Corey, thank you so much for that. You're welcome. And, and Sabrina. Thanks uh, for the people hanging on. Thanks for the people hanging on the call. I love I know, that. I, I know, I know. Let's do one more it. question, and then we really have to close out the show because we yep. are running very late. Okay, so Brad. You're staying on, though. Because Brad asked. Um, so remember earlier on in the show when you were asking, um, you know, how many times you sit in front of a customer and they do the test drive, and then you say, so what did you think about that? Right? right. Yeah, yeah. So. Brad wants to know, so is it better to ask them how they feel? Yes, that's my whole point. My whole <laughs> premise is to ask questions that make, force people to do, make emotional decisions. So if I said to you, how do you think about those numbers, I'm basically programming you to go, hmm, how do I think? Versus simply asking you, how do you, how do you feel about those numbers? All I'm doing is creating a slight change. And again, this is, I mean, this is psychology. It's not like made up, it's 100 years old. It's just our ability to execute on that. Like I can get people to do 60, you can get 66, uh, fun fact, you can get 66% more compliance from somebody by following what you want them to do with the word because and then finishing the sentence. So the example I always use, if I went to the airport right now and the security alarm was wrapped around the building and I just started going up to people, can I get in front of you, can I get in front of you, can I get in front of you? depending on what state I'm in, most people will look at me. <laughs> it never happened in New most, Jersey, but go ahead. People, right, right. Most people, Philly Airport, picking at uh, LaGuardia, most people will look at me like I'm crazy. If I went up to people and said, can I get in front of you uh, because I'm about to miss my plane and I'm trying to get home to my newborn daughter, right? They're not lying. I mean, it needs to be true. But it's the because and then the action. Where all automotive people are trained to just bark commands. Follow me, do this. Press hard, five copies, come on down. But, and then we wonder why there's resistance to, 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 to that. It's because we don't, so that's just a, uh, another, I'm just showing you how psychology can be used. It's a small change. So just asking that question, how, did you, how, how does the car feel to you? It makes them go here, right? Not here. How, what'd you, how do you think, what do you think about the car? Oh, it's okay. I mean, I kind of like it. Not how do you feel about it? Did you did you feel the acceleration? Did you feel that's what I want to I want to keep doing that over and over again? Just like using somebody's name. If I didn't know you and we spent a half an hour together, I could constantly use your name as I talk to you, and I would create a bigger relationship. You wouldn't know why you liked me more. I wouldn't know because I'm executing on that strategy. But you would like you would leave the call. You would leave the interaction liking me more, not knowing why. But psychologically, hearing our own name is as they say, the sweetest sounding voice to our ear. So it's all this psychology out there that allows us to, to execute and make these small changes over and over again to a wide, now I get to do it because I'm on camera, to a wider audience, my arms out here. You gotta go wide. Stop trying to figure out the tough, 
customer who doesn't want to do anything you want them to do, who doesn't want to come in, you know, I mean, who, who doesn't believe in any of that, doesn't, stop trying to figure that one little minuscule person out because you build processes to go after them when you're missing all these people out here that, that, will, that will follow your deal. Very, very. I'm learning a lot from you today, Corey. Thank I'm really you. Jeff, I'm really jammed up today. I don't yeah, know what you it are. is. I'm really, uh, I think it's the shirt. Yeah, this is, <laughs> Oh, audience, I hope you had as much fun today Thanks as, to as we did. hung in there. I love, I mean, I love the people, 80% of the people are still on. I mean, people got to sell cars. It's, it's 1.30 in the afternoon, Eastern, uh, so I get it. But I, I, I appreciate everybody that's on and hope you get your downloads, and it's great. Fantastic presentation, Corey. You never, ever, ever disappoint me, sir. Thank you so much. I love having you on my show. Let's get back together again soon, my friend. I can't All wait. Right. All right, um, and I'll, I'll be looking forward to seeing you at that um, uh, that uh, uh, internet, sales, internet sales performance internet summit. Sales You're coming to Philly, right? Summit. Yes, we will be in Philly. We will be in LA, and we you know supposed to sign up to get notified of that, but oh, we'll be in Philly. We'll be in LA, and we will be in Florida. So it's two days. Me, David Kane, names you know, Jennifer Suzuki, names you know, uh, and plus a, a couple of great guests. You know, Greg and Sean Raines, we know, we know we're going to have them down All there. All powerhouses. I love it, love it, love it. That's you're awesome. You're not going to want to miss it. We've never done anything like this before. So uh, if, you're, if you're able, uh, you're not going to want to miss it. I'm, I'm going to be there. All right. I want to remind the audience a link to download a copy of today's webinar recording is going to be emailed to you later today for your reference. Please feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues. Today's webinar is also going to be posted online within 24 hours. Just go to dealeron.com slash webinars. And from there, you can view our upcoming webinar schedule or access any of our past webinars too. And yeah, at the conclusion of this webinar, you're going to get a short survey, really short three questions. So I'm asking you, please fill it out. We're always looking for quality feedback from our audience. And we want yes, your you opinion to be heard. What? Want me back. No, yes, you love me. Yes, you want me to be back. Yes. And I, I don't know what the third one is. All that good stuff. All that good stuff. And yeah, we've been talking about it. It's happening. Three of the biggest names in automotive, David Kane, Corey Mosley, and Jennifer Suzuki joining forces to host the Internet Sales Performance Summit. This three-city tour is going to feature deep dive, hands-on training with David, Corey, and Jennifer, plus some special invited guests like members of the Dealer on Team, Greg Gifford, Sean Raines, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dates and locations soon to be announced. You can visit MosleyAutomotive.com and sign up to be the first to know when the Internet Sales Performance Summit will be in your city. Looking forward to it. And yeah, Dealer on is going to be exhibiting and presenting at the upcoming Digital Dealer Convention, April 11 through 13 in Tampa, Florida. So if you're going to be there, hey, stop by booth 411 and say hi. I'm going to be there. I'd love to meet you. You're going to also check out the incredible speaking sessions by Greg Gifford and Sean Raines. Remember, it's booth 411. I hope to see you there. And invitations will be going out tomorrow for our next Dealer On webinar, where an expert from Google is going to share new data on today's automotive path to purchase. Google, yeah, they've done it again. They have just completed a brand new comprehensive study on today's automotive path to the purchase. This groundbreaking breaking analysis on online shopping behavior traces the micro moments of a consumer's search for their next car and details which influencers are most critical to the process. This is huge news. To present material as vital as this, we called in an expert from Google to show us the latest information and how we can use it to sell more cars. In this fascinating and data-driven one-hour webinar, Andrew Diffenderfer from Google will outline a roadmap of online marketing strategies for auto dealers who want to take advantage of the crucial information held within this new report. Attendees will also get answers to several burning questions, such as, what is typically a consumer's first online micro-moment when car shopping? How can we reach and engage customers simply by knowing their micro-moments of influence? What can I offer online that will convince car buyers to come to my dealership? And what is the last online touch point before a consumer heads to a dealership? That sounds really good. One thing is certain, though. Consumers have changed the way they shop for cars. Has your dealership kept up? If you're ready to hear an expert from Google share new data on today's automotive path to purchase, then this is a must-see presentation, so register now. And don't forget, DealerOn's weekly webinars are held Thursdays, 12 noon Eastern, 11 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Mountain, and 9 a.m. Pacific. If you have questions, comments, or suggestions regarding our webinars and our topics, hey, contact me directly. I'd love to hear from you. Again, my name is Eliana Raggio. You can track me down online. I'm everywhere. Facebook, Twitter, Google+, I'm on all the automotive social networks. Or you know what? 
you can just email me directly at eliana at dealeron.com. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for spending this time with us today. And I hope to see you all on another webinar in our continuing education series. Take care. See you later. <laughs> Thanks.